Hello, and this is Rohan. And yeah, it's finally time to talk about Trails of Cold Steel 2. <clears throat> it's been a long time coming to make this video, but yeah, now I'm finally ready to do it. So yeah, let's just press on with it. So, Cold Steel 2 is the second game in the series, as well as the second part of the story for the Erebonia arc, and follows on from the events of Cold Steel 1. It was first released on the PS3 and PS Vita during 2014 in Asian Territory. Asian territories, and then it got localized during 2016. The version I play is the remastered version for the PS4, which is also available for PC. Now released in 2018, with the localized PS4 version coming in 2019. Uh, this version runs at 60 FPS, has higher quality audio, and includes all 102 DLC items. So yeah, that's um history of the versions. So after really enjoying Cold Steel 1, I'm gonna give the sequel a go too. Because, you know, I did do that my thoughts video on Cold Steel 1, I love a really long video, and yeah, I had a lot of fun talking about it, I had a lot of fun playing it, so of course I really want to try the sequel as well, to see how the story goes from the cliffhanger that Cold Steel 1 ended on. It would take me a while to play and finish Cold Steel 2, because um, Fire Engage released in January, so yeah, that took up a lot of my time, and then I also had my trip to the US, so I went to Texas, so yeah. Um, but then when I came back, it was Cold Steel's time to shine. And also during that time too, um, my brother wanted to get a new TV for himself, so yeah. I played a lot of Cold Steel 2 on that, and yeah, the game looked really good on that, but yeah, we'll talk about that later. But yeah, a pretty lengthy game this one, I think. I don't think it was as long as Cold Steel 1, but yeah, it is pretty hefty stuff. As you'd probably expect from a modern day RPG. But yeah, I had a lot of fun playing it, of course, and yeah, I'm going to be excited to make this video about it and talk about how I feel about it. So yeah, with that intro out of the way, let's start talking. And of course, yeah, um, I'm going to be spoiling a lot. I'm going to be spoiling basically everything um, in the plot. That also means I need to talk a little bit about Cold Steel 1 as well, so yeah, you have been warned. I think, yeah, this whole video is basically going to be one huge spoiler, so yeah. Because again, if you... <laughs> I'm going to be talking about the story most of the time, so yeah, it makes sense that, yeah, this whole video is going to be like that, so yeah, you have the more, so yeah. Let's move on to Stein to talk about the plot. Let's move on to the prologue now. So the game begins with Reen, short circles, who is now known, who is now at the Isengrad mountain range, and he's been unconscious for over a month after he escaped Tristan, the upper Valimar and Selene. Understand me, Reen is worried about leaving his friends like that. Because, yeah, you saw the ending of Cold Steel 1. Yeah, it was pretty, um, depressing to be honest, but yeah. Um, so he makes his way down the mountain while fighting enemies to get used to fighting again. As well as get the player acquainted with the battle system. It's pretty similar, but yeah, we'll get into that later. On the way, though, he encounters a magic knight. Basically a giant golem, these things are extremely strong. And the arena doesn't stand a chance against alone. But someone comes in to save the day. I got kind of a recurring theme in this game. Someone just comes in and saves the day. In this case, it's gonna be someone we didn't really get to see that much in Cold One. Tovel. Um, he's a fellow. He's a bracer, and he's a good friend of Sarah's. So yeah, and yeah, he did do a couple of things in Cold One, but Cold Two really fleshes him out. So yeah. He's not alone though, because Reen's sister Elise is here, and so is Princess Alpha. So, with Tovel's help, um, they make their way to Reen's hometown, Ymir. So, yeah, we actually get to see this place as well. So, this allows Reen to catch up with his parents too, Baron Schwarz and his wife, Lucia. As well as relax in the hot springs. Yeah, Ymir is a hot spring town. I do quite like it, like I said. The hot springs are kind of cool, the wintry atmosphere is kind of cool. There's a lot of cool stuff here. And also, yeah, it also gives him a chance to talk to his sister too. In the hot spring, but uh, <laughs> it wasn't that bad to be honest. It's actually a good scene to be honest. But anyway, after resting, the um, Reen along with Elise and Tovel go to Ymir Valley to check up on Valimar. Um, because yeah, that's where um, yeah they didn't decide to take him, obviously. He was resting too, most likely after um, helping Reen escape as well, so yeah. At the end though, that magic knight from before is back for revenge, and the three try to fight it, but once again it proves too strong. Proves too strong. So Reen summons Valimar to fight it off and defeat it. But unfortunately though, yeah, things take a turn for a worse, 
as a hologram of the Ouroboros Anglus Vita appears. And it turns out that Jaegers have come to attack Ymir as, as well. And then when they get back to Ymir, they heavily wound Baron Shores as well. But then, um... Vida comes back and she hypnotizes the Jaegers to make them leave and go back to the commander, showing that she wasn't the one that called the Jaegers so interesting stuff. But then uh, things get even worse, um, as a girl with a puppet much like Milliams from the first game comes in to kidnap the least of Alvin, so that Reen and Tove are all alone now. <laughs> it isn't all doom and gloom though, as thanks to Selene and Valimar, Reen actually learns that his classmates are alive. And are free and are at three different places. So he decides to go and meet up with them first. So thanks to Valmar's power tax as the spirit path to reach these places, Reen and Tovel decide to go to Celtic first. And yeah, that is the setup for Cold Steel 2's plot. And overall, it's a pretty interesting one that really helps set up what Reen will need to do in his journey, but it's also good to see him have some downtime with his family too. His chat with Elise and the Hot Strings is a pretty interesting one, quite important later on as well. Yeah, it's a little weird. When you think about it, because you know the bad connotations that Hot Springs have, like in Persona for example, like Persona 4 for example, but yeah, it was a good conversation. And yeah, like I said, it does have some payoff later on as well. So now that I've talked about the prologue and the set to the plot, let's move on to talking about some gameplay now. Alright, let's talk about some gameplay changes now. So yeah, while Cold Steel 2 does have, um, a pretty similar battle system, there are some new additions to make it fresh and stand out. So early on we learn about a new ability as a big help in battle called Overdrive. So to activate Overdrive, the gauge threat needs to be full, and that is the red circle in the battle UI. It's like on the top right, and the character who activates Overdrive must be linked with another character. With the um, um, Arcus Link system obviously. So yeah. The gauge is charged up by battling or winning battles as well. So, activating overdrive removes negative effects from both characters, like status conditions, heals 30% of the HP and EP, and recovers 30 CP. And the two characters in the next three turns with no delay attacks, starting with the person who initiate the overdrive. And these attacks always unbalance if they're able, and arts are instantly used. So yeah, as you can probably tell, yeah, this is extremely powerful. Once Act 2 of the game starts, you get a second gauge for Overdrive, and this can mean you can Overdrive back to back, which can make a big difference. Um, or, of course, you can use one early in the battle and save the other one for later, maybe to finish off the enemy. You can't use it to interrupt like an S-Craft, but still, it's really good. They, uh, I find it really fun due to how versatile it is, since it can be used for getting boss off my cheese and start battle, and getting off a lot of damage quick as you get a lot of bravery points from enemies always getting unbalanced. So yeah. So yeah, a lot of my late game strategies hinge on how powerful Overdrive was. Um, in the other game, I mainly just used it to help set myself up, but later on I used it for damage. Um, mostly. Of course, I think I did use it for damage like for most of the game, but yeah. I found the getting up the boss and stuff a bit more useful early on, but anyway. But yeah, who has access to Overdrive? So, Reen is able to Overdrive with anyone, but for the other members of Class 7, they need to unlock the ability by clearing the Trial Battles in the Blue Chest. So yeah, these can basically be found all around the world. Um, and yeah, if you use some... Um, I forget what it's called, I think it's Information or something like that, you can of course spot them like any other chest. Um, these battles are normally against bigger versions of the enemies around the area, and you don't... and you have to use the characters that the chest mentions. So if it mentions like let's say um, Elisa or Gaius, you have to use those two together. Um, and then that's all you get. Some chests though have four characters, so yeah. That's also pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, another thing about these chests is that they even have some kind of chest quotes if you don't have the correct characters or the power, which is funny. Basically they talk about a joke between the two characters or something like that. It's pretty fun stuff. But anyway. Guest characters generally can only overdrive with green, and maybe another character they're close with, so yeah. Tobal's a good example actually, who we get at the beginning. You can only overdrive with green normally, but you can also overdrive with Sarah too, so that's pretty cool. Saying so, while on the topic, the max bond level has been raised from 5 to 7, 
allowing more link abilities to be gone, and I do remember the rank 7 ability being 1.2 times more damage during overdrive, which, yeah, that kind of factored into my late game strategies. As you probably thought, that was very useful. I think some of these bond abilities have also been changed, some characters gain a ability that recovers their CP if their partner takes damage. I think it's like called Anger or stuff like that. That one was pretty cool. I don't remember it being a cold still one, so that was pretty cool. Um, and yeah, that also proved decently useful as well, especially in the late parts of the game, so yeah. Now, overall though, I do think that Overdrive might be the best new addition to the battle system, considering the many strategies it helps in making. So yeah. And yeah, that's definitely one good reason to play Calls too, because yeah, Overdrive is really cool, and yeah, I can't wait to see what <laughs> is done with it in future games as well. But anyway, let's talk about the changes to Orbits now. So in this game, every character's slots have already been opened, but you do need to spend Seatlift to upgrade these slots so they can hold rarer quartz. Restricted element slots only need the matching element of Seat or Seat. Yeah, Sepith in order to upgrade them, so a restricted fire slot only needs fire Sepith to be upgraded, while other slots need all elements of Sepith, so I generally find them hard to upgrade, and you need higher amounts of Sepith for slots that are further down the orbit line. So yeah, I find this system alright, since it does give a use for all that Sepith you collect, even if it's quite annoying to upgrade every slot to max, but I do find I don't need everything um, to be maxed out, since there isn't too much shipper records to warrant that, so upgrading once for all those slots does just does do just fine for a good amount of the game. But yeah, if you do start running into super rare quartz, you can obviously, you know, go with um, if need be. But anyway. So let's talk about the structure a little bit. So the first set of Call Steel 2 does follow a structure. But things are a bit more free when compared to Cold Steel 1. First, you may as your base, and where each part of Act 1 starts. I do like this place since the focus on hot strings is really neat, and the snow makes the place really pretty. Yeah, like I said. Um, I do like Ymir as like a hub board of sorts, it's pretty cool. The main thing that can be done in here is view bonding events, which work the same way as Cold Steel 1. They can view a limited amount of of them and you can gain one experience for the person being taught to. This includes the guest characters you get as well. So of course yeah. Um they're pretty similar stuff. So but yeah again. You know yeah the bond conversations do work similarly, they they're pretty good. There's some pretty good conversations here. And I'll be sure to touch up on maybe some of my favorites later. But anyway. There are also side quests that can be done here and you can trade your angler points for your fishing gear too. Yeah, fishing comes back, it's basically the same as it was before. Although, yeah, um, there are definitely some difficult fish to catch, especially later in the game. But anyway, the parts of Act 1 are pretty simple, where you, or, yeah, the parts of Act 1 are pretty simple, where, you, where you're allowed to pick whoever you have reunited to come along, as well as one guest character. Um, you can gain more characters to use by reuniting Green with his classmates, and then you can use them to beat the main objectives to request the plot, as well as partake in cycles, such as pull for rewards, and academic points or AP, which ranks how well Reen is doing as a student. And reaching new ranks offers more rewards. So you, be, you do want to make sure that you're, you're doing a lot of side quests, and yeah, of course. Um, the characters you get, obviously, you can pick whoever you want to. Yeah, you're more free to basically pick whoever you want, which is an interesting change from compared to Cold Steel 1. Um, Guest characters, of course, are a little bit more limited, but that's okay. Um, and yeah, like I said, side quests are important. <laughs> you never want to do side quests. But on the topic of them, there are these also reward money too, so getting money feels a lot easier when compared to Cold Steel 1. One thing that also really helped was talking to everyone I could, since you never know when one person could have a hidden quest, something I don't think I found in Cold Steel 1. So yeah, like I said, um, just talk to random NPCs, sometimes they'll just give you a quest out of nowhere. So yeah, I believe that's the reason why my rank in Call Still 1 wasn't that good, because I didn't really talk to everyone everywhere, so then I probably missed a couple of side quests, but yeah, that's okay. At least, yeah, in Call Still 2, because I had that familiar with Call Still 1, that's why, yeah. Um, that's why, yeah, I was able to find one of these quests, but anyway. The cycles also don't feel too bad to complete either, probably because my experience of course one helped me out in that regard. So it's like a good idea of what to expect. See, that also helped, obviously. 
Overall, while Cold Steel 2 does feel quite similar to Cold Steel 1, these changes do improve the gameplay by quite a bit, and do help the Cold, um, Cold Steel 2 still feel like a fresh and new experience to see. So yeah. Again, it's mostly small changes to the gameplay. Um, there are definitely some more new additions that I can't wait to talk about as well. Um, later on, but yeah, like I said, it is definitely very familiar to the previous game, but that's okay. The previous game did have a very good battle system, obviously, and the gameplay was still pretty solid too. So yeah, um, I still quite like um, Cold Steel 2, even though, yeah, like I said, it's a bit similar, but again, the new additions, especially Overdrive, do really make help make this game stand out, so yeah. I do quite like that quite a bit, but anyway, now we talked a lot about the gameplay, let's continue talking about the plot. Anyway, back to the plot now, so yeah, let's continue talking about Act 1. So yeah, now that Reno and Tuval have arrived in Celtic, they head to the town and try to find some clues on how to progress. So yeah, these clues lead to um, the windmill outside town. And yeah, this allows Reen to reunite with his very first class and that'll be Marcus. And yeah, as you can probably tell from the cutscene, yeah, this meant so much to Reen. Um, and I do feel for him now that, yeah, he's made a good start on reunite all class 7 as well. So yeah, he is also alongside Elliot and Fee. So yeah, thanks to Marcus, we're able to find them as well. And yeah. The next main objective now was to explore the ruined Gorelia Fortress. So yeah, in Calls to One, this place was annihilated. So yeah, I guess we're gonna find... I guess we're gonna go there and find out what's going on there. So yeah, you make it there, after, you know, making your way, finding some enemies, and you find some chests. There you face up against Zeno and... Um, Leo. <laughs> I'm gonna call it, because yeah, his name is a little bit complicated, so I think it's Leon. Um, Leondis, or something like that. I'm just gonna call Leo, but anyway. They are regiment commanders of Zephyr, and all companions of Fee. Um, yeah, remember that Fee used to be a Jaeger herself, and she used to be a um, part of Zephyr. They seem to not have a grudge against Rain in that party, but they gotta do what they were asked to do, so battle commences. And yeah, this is a tough battle. I do remember it being quite difficult for me as well. I think they can also use S cross against you as well. Um, but it gets interrupted by Panzer Soldat Squad from the Noble Alliance. So now it's time for Reen to summon Valmar to fight them off. So let's talk about another gameplay change while we're here too, and that is the Vine Knight Battle. So these are more realized thanks to the help of Reen um, and his classmates. So what the classmates can do is that they can pro um, um, is that they also get turns during battle. And able to use their own arts to support Valmar, whether it's providing buffs or recovering HP and or CP, or dealing extra damage and elemental art damage. And yeah, those extra turns are very useful. And yeah, once I learned how to make the most out of them, yeah, that's when these Divine Knight battles got started to get really fun. But yeah. But yeah, the partners can also do other things too. They can also help recover um, Valmar's health too and CP. Because yeah, Valmar, yeah, without CP, he can't really do much. So you definitely want to make sure you get a lot of that. Um, it's quite useful to have a lot of CP. And yeah, that <laughs> goes to show who I like to use um, Valmar with as like one pipe. So yeah, you can also switch them up very freely during their turn as well. So like you could use feed to buzz speed and just switch her out. That's not a bad idea either. So yeah. So now we've learnt about how to fight with Valmar a little bit, um, Reen is able to defeat the Soldats. And then Lieutenant General Cray, as well as Captain Claire, arrive on the scene, um, forcing the remaining Soldats to retreat. So yeah, good to see these two alive, obviously. We didn't, I think, yeah, we weren't sure what happened to Craig, obviously, because of the destruction of Grey Fortress, but yeah. And also, of course, the Soldats too. That, they could have caused a lot of problems as well, but yeah. And also, Claire's just fine after the events of the last game, where things didn't go so great for her, let's just say. But anyway. Um, so, those two discussed their plans with Evord on how and on how to deal with the Noble Alliance. With Reen saying that he has no plans to join the Erebon army, as he's more concerned with finding the rest of his classmates. So, yeah. That is the priority. But anyway, Claire will also accompany 
green bat to me as well, and she sports a very nice looking disguise. She basically wears some casual wear so that people don't recognize her. It looks pretty cool. But anyway. Um, and that is basically the first part of the app. So yeah, a pretty good one to play, as well as getting back the classmates felt great too. And it's great to see him interrupt the Reen too, and the difficulty proved a decent balance, despite this being very early on in the game. And yeah, well I didn't talk about him too much yet, Tovel is a pretty cool guest during this time. He has that level head, which yeah, he backs like basically a voice of reason throughout this part of the act, so that's pretty cool. And yeah, he's pretty cool to have around, and yeah, for gameplay he's actually a lot of fun, because he's a very competent caster, and his accessory lowers casting type of arts, and yeah, that's really good. And he's also the only person that can use it, which is also pretty interesting. But yeah, you know he is mostly an art user, his crafts are also pretty good too. And I definitely use them a good amount too. So yeah, that's the first part of Act 1. Let's move on to the next one. So yeah, let's move on to the next part. So yeah, after returning to Ymir for a break and a chance to re-interview more bonding events, they make their way to Nord next. They can bring a choice of characters, like I said before, and one guest. So yeah, Claire's a cool choice because, of course, she's new. And yeah, she's a pretty good guest character because yeah, she can mix attack pretty good and has some very nice cross on her side. Her accelerate craft also looks pretty strong even though I didn't use it, like at all I think. Because it also boosts stats, which is really cool. But anyway, so onwards to Nord. So Nord, yeah, things aren't looking too great here either, as there's this as the Watchtower has been taken over by the Noble Alliance because um, they basically did this joint attack with Calvard. Um, they got assistance from them, and yeah, that's how they took the Watchtower. And yeah, there's also the Northern Jaegers too, and they're the terrorizing the land as well. So yeah, it's not great. And yeah, these Jaegers also ambush Reen and and company, but yeah, that's when Gaius comes in. He rescues them, and yeah, with his help, they make it to where the cell has moved due to the problems happening in North. Now it's near this lake, which actually looks pretty cool to be honest, but anyway. Um, so Gaius is back. Um, pretty cool dude. Again, he's not like the most relevant character in the game's plot, but he is still very fun to use, and he's actually extremely useful, as I'll talk about later, but anyway. Um, so anyway, they explore more of Nord, the new northern section I do believe. We weren't able to explore that before I'm pretty sure. And yeah, that's when Elise and William are trying to fire off this cryptid. And it's actually uncertain from Costa 1, an extremely infamous boss, but yeah. Um, he's a lot easier now, so... Imagine the feeling, but yeah. The fact that this cryptid appeared though is um, pretty noticeable. Because yeah, apparently I think calling to sailing, they only start appearing when um, um, chaos is going around, and yeah, of course, due to the war, that's probably what's causing these guys to appear over Erebonia. But anyway, we obviously defeat it, and now we can reunite with Elisa and Milia. Of course, Elisa is great to see because Rina and Elisa have great chemistry, and yeah, this game is going to show that to you a lot. But anyway, but Milia's also good to see her. She gets to reunite with Claire because yeah, she's good buddies with her. Because yeah, they both I'm pretty sure that, yeah, they both work towards the RMP, of course, Claire's the leader, but anyway. Uh at least William used to until she became a member of class of it. But anyway. Um Gwyn is also here and they talk about what they can do about the watchtower. So another thing about this watchtower is that it now has a jamming device installed. And this is causing problems for the 3rd Armour Division. Um, who, yeah, that's led by Zex Vanda, I do believe. Um, and yeah, we met him before in Costa 1. He's the one who um, got, um, who helped um, Gaius go to the academy in the first place. So he's a pretty cool dude. And yeah, of course, helping him out would be a nice favor. But anyway. But of course, yeah, the thing about this jamming device is that, yeah, um, the Third Armor Division can't use all the communications, but the Noble Lions can. So yeah, that puts them at a big disadvantage. So, um, the group now decides that yeah, the next primary objective is going to be to infiltrate the Watchtower and yeah, destroy the, the jamming device. So yeah, you make it to the top, you fight like a lot of Jaegers along the way, and 
I'm watching though, there's some pretty tough opposition waiting for them at the top. And that'll be Blue Block and Altina. Altina was the um, person with the puppet that looked like William earlier. She's the one that kidnapped um, um, Elise and Alf Suga. So, yeah, this is kind of a difficult battle because again, Blue Bonk is an enforced for Aerob or Ouroboros, so yeah, he is pretty difficult. Um, he was pretty difficult in previous tiles too because yeah, you also fought him in the Sky games, I'm pretty sure as well, so yeah. It was kind of terrifying to go up against them for the first time in my career, but yeah, I managed to beat them both, obviously. But then Blue Bunt reveals a trump card, and he, he uses it to basically lock everyone in place. So this gives Rain the idea to maybe use his Yoga powers. I didn't actually mention this earlier, but he did try to use the Yoga powers against the Yeekers that tried to attack his father, but then yeah, um, Vita came in to stop that, but yeah. He thinks about use it here, but then we have another person called to rescue. That's gonna be Sharon. Um, and yeah, she basically stops um, Blue Block's trump card, and yeah, manages to free them from um, being stuck in place. And then yeah, this causes Blue Block and Altina to retreat for them. So anyway, after that though, some, the Noble Alliance comes in with some Soul Dots, but then Rain uses Varmar to fight them off. So they. With the Pistis and Reen Dut, or Nord Dut, sorry, they return to your mid for a break. So yeah, there you go. That's the second part. The basically Nord. I'm exploring this place. So yeah, um, I quite liked it too. Nord is still kind of annoying to explore though. You do get horses and stuff to help out, but yeah, um, it's still huge. So, still kind of a pain to explore. Um, the mission was pretty cool. And yeah, getting to play Blue Block for the first time was pretty cool. And yeah, you also get some extremely good um, allies and Gaius, Elisa. Elisa's back with her CP restoration, which again I used a lot. And Sharon is also very cool too. She's a guest character, but a very strong one, so yeah, that's also good to see. Um, I also like the character modes with those three as well. And yeah, Claire was able to help out a little bit too. It was cool to see her reunite with Milliam as well. Yeah, I think she was pretty cool in this part. Um, not my favorite guest character, obviously, but yeah, still pretty cool stuff. So that's the end of Act 2, let's move, or not Act 2, Part 2 of Act 1. Let's go on to the, the third part. And let's talk about the third part now, which is where Reen makes his way to the Um Again, you can pick who comes along, and you'll have one guest character. And yeah, Sharon's going to be the newest guest character. Probably my favorite in the game, too. She does a lot of damage with her cross, they're pretty cool as well, and they have a focus on debuffing, so like, lowering stats, afflicting star elements, pretty cool stuff. And yeah, there's even a CP recovery craft too, and <laughs> it's a really cool looking one, the t tile obviously. So yeah, very versatile, and yeah, definitely one of my favorite guest characters to use. So, let's go to the ground now. So it's really foggy again, and the group suspects that something must be causing this. So, they make it to the town and make their way to the Bracer Guild and learn that Laura and Emma are exploring the castle, Longgrim Castle. So the group follows them and sees those two flying off more cryptids. So they come in and help out. So yeah, and that allows Laura and Emma to be reunited with them. So yeah, of course Emma is a very good caster and Laura is still a physical powerhouse. And one of my favorite characters to use, so yeah. On the way back to the Gram, Emma is finally able to reveal to Reen that she is a member of the Hexen clan. And yeah, but Reen really shows her that despite that, she is still a proud member of Class 7. And that proved a pretty sweet card moment for um, Emma too. So I quite like that quite a bit. Yeah, again. Um, we didn't, the group didn't really get to know that. We did know that, yeah, Emma was related to Vita in some way during Cold Still 1, but yeah, again. Um, the group didn't know because they were um, pretty preoccupied with the fact that yeah, Osman got shot. But anyway, um, so and now they need to go for Yusus, who wasn't actually with them, but of course he's most likely in Bereahard. So yeah, let's make our way there. It's a kind of long trek, but yeah, and of course this is kind of a dangerous place to go to because 
the Noble Alliance is pretty strong there because, yeah, Brehard, um, the Upper Air family, yeah, the Upper Air family is pretty, um, well, at least seems pretty close knit with um, the Nova Alliance here. It's going to be kind of dangerous, but yeah, thanks to Emma with her witch powers, they're able to enter Brayheart without getting the Nova Alliance's attention. And after gathering some more clues, they find uses aboard an airship at the airport, and they have a talk. So, yeah. So, yeah, of course, this is where uses becomes pretty interesting. And um, due to being an Albrea, he's forced to stay with the Nova Alliance, so he cannot return to Class 7. Marine tries to convince him as Eustace is his own person, so he decided to duel to figure out who is in the right. So yeah, this is a pretty cool duel to be honest. Um, you have a horse riding duel first, and yeah, this is really cool because you get to use um, Angelica's bike. Something that, yeah, you don't get to like drive um, during Cold Still 1, but here you do, and that's really cool. So yeah. So you win that, and then it's time for the sword deal. This one's kind of difficult. Um, but yeah, Reen would eventually beat Eustace and, fu and fully convince her to rejoin Class 7. But unfortunately, the Reen get gets cut short because Ouroboros is back. But this time, they are um, bringing Enforcer number 1, McBurn, and the Star Ridder Head Knight, Doofily. The Swift. Um, so then you have to fight them both. Duvely isn't too bad and will go down eventually, but McBurn is just too much. He completely overpowers the group. He doesn't look, even look like he's trying to, so yeah. So things are looking kind of hopeless, but then again, someone comes up to save the day. This time, Instructor Sarah, making her appearance. So yeah. But yeah, after that though, another instruction comes. This time, Duke Operator, this is Eustace's father. Um, he appeared with a group of soul darts, and there's even a new type of soul dart too, the Hector unit. And then McBurn loses interest because he's quite a lazy dude and leaves. And yeah, of course, Doobly ain't too happy about that either, so she also leaves. But anyway. So with the help of Valmar, the soul darts are finished off, and then they're able to escape back to Emer. So yeah, there's that. Um, although things are a little bit different here, so... So now that everyone's been reunited at Ymir, they decide to go, um, decide what to do next. They decide to go on their own path and not side either the Noble Alliance or the Imperial Army. This is kind of weird actually, because um, you basically kind of help out the Imperial Army anyway throughout this plot. I mean, you don't necessarily follow them exactly, but it does feel like, yeah, you're helping them defeat the Nova Alliance, so yeah, it, is, it doesn't really feel like the own path, but again, that's just a small nitpick, but anyway. Unfortunately though, this meme about what they're gonna do gets interrupted, because yeah, a lot of things get interrupted this plot, I just realized, but anyway. Um, Vita's her again, and she also announces that the Nova Alliance is also gonna be hitting you with but the airship, and yeah, um, there's a lot of important members coming along here too. They got the members of Zephyr again, Leo and Zeno, there's Ouroboros too, even Rufus is here too. Yeah, that's Eustace's brother, and yeah, he seems to be on the side of the Noble Alliance as well. Um, and yeah, of course, another important person, Crow. Yep. Um, <laughs> Crow, yeah. Rain definitely has a lot of stuff to say about him, so yeah. So here, you have an interesting situation where the class members try to take on Rufus. And you can fend them off. It's quite difficult, but yeah, he is a pretty strong opponent. Um, but yeah, the battle does end in, in a stalemate though. Rain does try to take on Crow, but yeah, this seems like a hopeless battle. I don't think you can win this one, so yeah. I lost it too, so yeah. But yeah, Rain's no match for Crow, and that's mainly due to Valmon not having a strong enough weapon to use against Ordeen. Of course, that'll be Crow's Divine Knight. Um, and then Duke Kaya, the lead of the Noble Alliance, also appears on the Hologram and he invites Serene um, to board his airship so he can join the Noble Alliance. Yeah, this seems like a terrible idea, but Serene senses an opportunity to maybe learn about the enemy, so he sets the invite. And then there you go, that ends Act 1 of Cold Steel 2. So let's talk about it. So yeah, this last bit of the first up is also pretty interesting. It's great to see all of Laura, Emma, and Yusus 
And also Sarah too. Sarah is now a Pi member as well, and a full-time one, so yeah, that is amazing. <laughs> um, and then Yus has also had some pretty thought-provoking moments in this part too. Yeah, you can definitely tell that, yeah, these guys have definitely developed a little bit since Cool in 1, so yeah. Of course, Sharon's also a very fun guest card to use. Um, and yeah, she's pretty fun with Elisa too. Those two actually can overdrive with each other, and they have a pretty strong um, bond already, so yeah. Verns are also really stepping up as well, because you have Ouroboros being terrifying with their number one and four summon Vern. And you also got Rufus, Vita, and Cayenne, who are proving quite cunning at this point. And then yeah, we got an interesting cliffhanger Reen leaving to board the Pontypool as the airship. And yeah, that's an um, interesting cliffhanger to end this act as well. So yeah, Act 1, yeah, it does do a pretty good job of setting up the plot as a whole as well. Um, of course, yeah, this part is all about reuniting the concepts, and yeah, this is a pretty fun um, um, part of the game to do so, obviously. You also get to see the areas and see how they change as well. There's a lot of cool stuff with this act, to be honest, so yeah. So yeah, let's see now what's happening on board the Pontacru now. So yeah, now we have the intermission. So, and yeah, that of course takes place on the Pontacru. So here, Kyan states that he wants Reen to join the Noble Alliance so he can end the war as swiftly as possible. Which would also reduce the amount of blood that needs to be shed, and Reen would make that much easier thanks to Valamar. So yeah. After that little speech, um, Reen was done giving us some time to think this through, and then Crow would come to pay my visit. So yeah, now it was time for um, Reen to learn about why Crow did what he did in Costa 1. Of course, murder Osborne. So the short answer is that Osborne basically caused the downfall of his hometown to Rai, as well as his grandfather too, which would lead him, um, um, that grandfather to his death as well, and all because of Osborne's schemes too. So yeah. Pretty simple motivation, and Crow even admits that himself, and also tells Reen not to let it influence his decision. I say it does work, since it does give Crow a somewhat legitimate reason to go after Osborne and form the Imperial Liberation Front, with other people that were also run by Osborne. So, yeah. <clears throat> so, after that, um, after you form the um, Imperial Liberation Front, Vito would then help Crow become Ordine's awakening. And then he would enroll himself in force to help cover his goal of killing Osborne. So there you go. That is of course Crow's backstory. But yeah, with that talk out of the way, Crow suggests to Reen that he visit the guests of Honor's room and that he can escape if he wants, but he'll have to fight his way through everyone else on board. So yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, now Reen is still unsure what to do, so he decides to explore the ship, which allows him to talk to some more of the antagonists. So yeah, we get to see the um, members, the other members of the Imperial Liberation Front, that'll be Scarlet and Vulcan. You can also get to talk to Blue Block, you can talk to Zeo, you can talk to Leo, you can talk to Duvali, and you can also talk to McBurn as well. These are some pretty cool conversations. Um, you get to learn about the motivations, and also get some advice from them, which is pretty interesting too. Like, even McBurn gives um, Reen some advice, which is not what I was expected to be honest, but anyway. So now you're able to go to the guest of honor's room, Reen finds Princess Elfin here, and he learns that Elise is being held with the rest of the Imperial family in Heimdall. So Elfin also wants to know what Reen wants to do, and he responds by saying that he doesn't want to side with the Noble Alliance, but there's also a desire to end the war early for Elise's sake. But then Elfin probably makes the most important role in the plot, in, well, the most important thing she does in the plot. So she responds with a heartfelt speech, telling Reen that he shouldn't use Elise as an excuse, as Elise's greatest desire is that Reen follows the path he believes in the most. And yeah, this is a big wake up call for Reen, as he realized that those who cherish him also feel the exact same way about. So yeah, this is of course Reen's character growth moment, but it also helps control the powers that he used. But also helps control the powers that used to torment him as well, which leads Reen to getting a new craft called Spirit. Unit. So, and yeah, now the answer is clear that Reen wants to escape the Pantacle with Elise. Or oh, Alvin, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, Alvin here is a guest, but all she can do is cast arts. So yeah, that's pretty basic stuff. Um, 
so they continue to make that way, but they come across Blue Blanc and Duvali. And yeah, like Crow said, yeah, everyone was going to try and stop it. But now Rin is able to show off what Spirit Unification is all about. And yeah, this allows Rin to transform into this Ogre form, but this time you can actually control it, so yeah. So what it does is that Boss's stats, piles up all of his cross, and it normally lasts for 3 turns, but this section it doesn't have a time, so yeah. Um, yeah, this is a great transformation. The power that cross are great. The damage he can do, he can do is pretty great. And yeah, I definitely got a lot of use out of this. Um, so with this newfound power, Rain made it to the deck of the ship, no problem, dodging all of those dangerous opponents. But Crow was there waiting for him, so they have a duel. And yeah, with this newfound power, Rain is able to come out on top. But unfortunately, the power runs out before he can land the fishing blow. And also his pursuer is also caught to the corner. Luckily though, the rear opponents are the courageous. Yeah, it comes to the rescue, with Reen's allies, including class 7, coming into cover Reen. And yeah, there's a big surprise for Reen, with another surprise coming in the form of course Prince Oliver, the owner of the courageous, and the chairman of force coming to help as well. Of course there's his airship, so that makes sense. Um, Say, so with a huge amount of manpower on both sides, the battle would likely end in the draw, so Vita suggests that the Noble Alliance take their lead, avoiding a pointless battle. So yeah. And of course allows Reen and the others to escape the scape, including Valamor as well, who was taken onto the particle as well. And yeah, I did like this intermission quite a bit as well, because yeah, we get an idea of the thought process behind most of our enemies, even if Crow's motivation is a bit basic. And yeah, we also got to see Breen's character development too, as he learns that he doesn't have to be um, selfless all the time, and he can afford to be a bit selfish at points. As the ones that cherish him want him to be free to choose what he wants to do, of course. Um, and yeah, of course, I feel like the, the intermission does a really good job of bridging the first and second acts to go and say, uh, And yeah, that's really it for the intermission. Now things are about to get pretty interesting with Act 2, because not only are we continuing the plot, but the gameplay is going to be changing a bit too. So let's move on. So with the creators back as well as Oliver and Viscount RC, who was the captain of the ship before, Class 7 is now ready to answer what they want to do. So yeah, they decide they're going to help the country get through this crisis. So. After hearing that, Oliver decides to entrust the Courageous to Class 7, which also allows him to make use of its facilities. This can allow Oliver to travel to Western Herobone to see what he can do there, while Class 7 can manage things in Eastern Herobone. Toa is also named the captain of the ship too. Acting captain, I do believe. Um, Toa and Claire are also go to leave so they can manage things in their own end. So with Toa and Class 7, they decide what the plans moving forward are going to be. Um, and of course the main goal, with the main goal being they want to take back fours, but to do that they need to increase their numbers by rescuing the fellow students who are scattered across the country. So, like I said, there's a big shift in the gameplay now because of the creatures. So, like I said, getting it really changes the gameplay drastically. So yeah, it's kind of like getting an airship in a Final Fantasy game. Well, the world is now free to explore to your heart's content, and this also means that side quests are also scattered around the world now as well. Other than that, the side quests aren't too different, but you obtain and report them from the computer of the Courageous. Um, another important part of this part of the plot is rescuing the students. You don't need to rescue all of them, but, it's, but it is strongly advised. So, the general... Um, formula, I guess, with a student is that when you find them, they want you to complete a task for them so they can join you, or you need to wait for more plot progress before they give you the task. So yeah. The things they can ask you for, mainly it's just like side quests and stuff, but sometimes it's a bit more simple, like they want to see a some, someone, like a fellow classmate or even one of your class 7 members, so yeah. So there's that. Um, once you do rescue the student, they'll go on board the ship, and and some of them even provide your facility in the Courageous as well. Um, and these can help your gameplay as well. It's like there's a shop for buying all so there's shops for buying all sorts of weapons, accessories, armors, and other items. But some of these items can only be gone here. 
They're getting off the side of it, like the practice battles, where like you can get some U material. And there are even some like side activities to do with food you can make with the cooking as well. Like if you fill out like, if you make the certain type of um, like there is like four main results in here, you can give, and then there's like one person who wants to see each type, so yeah. That's like a little side activity you can do, I didn't do that personally, but it does sound kind of interesting. But anyway. So yeah, there's a lot that you can get from just rescuing these students, so yeah, I highly recommend um, hunting them down. Um, and, you know, getting all those facilities up in um, the courageous. But anyway, some other side to these also plan filling some goals for Alfin. Yeah, Alfin is on the courageous too, um, in her own little room, and yeah, she is quite important for the plot too, but yeah. Her little side activity is getting the three medals from her. Um, and this relates to another side activity too, once you rescue one of the students, um, these optional fights open up against some cryptids. There's like four of them I do believe. They're basically kind of like um, tough optional bosses, maybe even super bosses too. Um, but the theme them is pretty cool because they drop a special type of quartz. Um, this one has multiple elements and allows the use to use a lost art which are arts with powerful effects but are hard to pull off due to long casting time, using up all your EP and only being able to use once per battle. But these are pretty neat rewards and yeah, from these card top battles and yeah, like I said, the lost arts can be quite interesting. Um, and yeah, you also want to k kill all the cryptids because that's one of the objectives for Alfred's medal, so yeah. And then finally, a pretty free on who you can bring. But generally speaking, one character other than Reem will be forced in, so it's wise to try and use everyone and let the rubber band EXP help them catch up. So yeah. So yeah, overall, the Kratos really helps Act 2 stand out in a much different way. Not only to the first act, but also Cold Steel 1, with your freedom to explore everywhere and even locate optional areas and fights too. This kept the gameplay fresh, but also made me curious where we are headed next in the main plot. So like I said, I really love this. It makes the gameplay stand out a lot more from close to one, and yeah, this is definitely a great addition. That yeah, helps the gameplay stand out, and yeah, definitely makes this game like worthy to be a sequel as well, because it's adding on to what the previous game did. So yeah, I really like <laughs> the creatures, as you can probably tell. Now we talked about that and its effect on the gameplay, let's move on and talk about um, Act 2 now. So let's start on Act 2. So after completing the first batch of cyclists, we learned that Elliot's sister Fiona had been taken hostage, most likely to manipulate General Craig into doing something favorable to the Noble Alliance. So Class 7 decides to take matters in their own hands and help save Fiona in their first operation in the So this is a pretty simple one. They make it to the bridge, which is being guarded by the Soldats, but Valma helps make short work of them. They then infiltrate the inside area and make it to the end, but the enemy commander sicks some giant dovins on them. They are pretty easy to beat, but the commander summons even more of them. But then we get help from Instructor Nightheart, so we are able to save Fiona no problem there. And yeah, Nightheart is also going to help General Craig by re-establishing their base at Twin Dragon's Bridge, while Class 7 takes a break at Sildeck. So these breaks allow Reen to engage in bonding events, much like that. So yeah, like I said, this is a very short, simple start to Act 2. Um, but yeah, of course, things do start to ramp up a lot. And yeah, this is your first operation, so I guess they want to like, you know, um, bring you in a little bit. And yeah, of course, with Fiona being the hostage here, of course, you want to bring Elliot along. I think he's forced to, and yeah. It is also great to see him reunite with his sister as well, that was very sweet. And yeah, while he isn't like the most memorable main character, it is nice to see him get some moments like this, where he has the result up at his sister too. Um, during this part too, he also learned his new S-Craft. Yeah, characters get a second S-Craft. Um, normally it's like stronger than the first one, but in Elliot's case, he actually gets a healing S-Craft, which is really cool. Um, and yeah, probably much better that of his regular S class. So yeah, I really like that. Yeah, like I said, Elliot, again, not like my most favorite main character, but yeah, hey, he does do the job quite well and did like the fact that, yeah, he was a good part of this first short part of the acts of Act 2, so yeah. 
And anyway, things are starting to ramp up, so let's go on to the next part. Now things are about to get a bit more interesting at two. So after completing some more cyclists, Angelica comes into contact with Class 7. And she states that the Rhymeford Company is being occupied by her uncle, and Irina was being confined in the building too. So yeah. <clears throat> So of course Angelica was in the first game too, and she was one of the buddies with um, Toa and George, so yeah. So I'm going to be helping her out, so yeah. Here in this classroom decides to help, but the leaves are being forced to cover one too, I'm pretty sure, so yeah. So yeah, things aren't good in Rora, things are in a very sorry state with, um, with the situation of course going on with the building, the Rhineford building, so yeah. Um, so again, we look for some more clues, and we do find Angelica, and she has the skies as a, um, cleric or sister. So anyway, she has formed a resistance of sorts, and has also tried convincing her father to lead the Noble Alliance, but it wasn't working. It seems the only way to convince them will be by force, so Angelica has been thinking of plans to do so before class on her right. But yeah, now we have Angelica though, it's time to go rescue Arena first, then we can deal with, um... Then we can deal with, um, Angelica's father later, obviously. So yeah, Angelica's also already located where Arena is. She's in a train within the Saxon Iron Mine. So yeah. So Angelica, gameplay-wise, is pretty similar to a Callista 1 kind of part. Um, she's again a guest character for this part, but she's still quite powerful, and... Um, still has a really hard hitting cross too, and her master course is still pretty cool as well, so yeah. Yeah, master course has been changed a little bit, I think her one can give you triple advantages more often, which is really nice, but yeah. But yeah, we make it through the iron mine, it wasn't easy to rescue Irina because the area was guarded by more Jaegers, but they do manage to rescue with some more surprise help with Sharon as well. Of course, yeah, Sharon is very ro loyal to the Rhymeford Company, so it makes sense that she should come in to help out. With that all done, it was time to take back control of the Rhymeford building from Angelica's uncle. So, yeah. They reach the top, flying through a lot of archaisms along the way, but this uncle summons a special archaism. It has the battle data of a fellow 8 leaves member like Green, which is pretty cool. Uh, it was quite strong, but it's still no match for the group, and now they're able to retake the building. So yeah, with of course Arena and Shannon's help as well. So yeah, while they go deal with that, it's now time to do something about Marcus Rockner. That's of course Angelica's father. So she goes off and wishes and wish to sell this on her own. So she visits a place in her own soldier. Yeah, she can pile one of these, which is kind of cool. And the two have a one on one deal against each other. And Chaluka win out against Rockner. And he would announce his withdrawal from the war, which should be a major blow for the Noble Alliance. But things aren't going to end super smoothly, though. Because Vulcan makes an appearance again. And he's using a new type of soldier, this giant model called the Goliath unit. You know? And yeah, he requests a deal with Reen, so it's time for another Divine Knight battle. And yeah, it was at this point in the game that I learned the best way to deal with one-on-one -on -one Divine Knight battles like this. So, Gaius of course is the Wild Heart craft. This craft, normally what it does is, is that, um... You lower your own HP to give you more CP. And yeah, that basically works the same way with Valamar. So... This means that Varma is very easily going to be able to afford this expensive cross. I believe one of the best ones to spam is Heavenly Slash. It's strong and it always seals the enemy, so we can deal massive damage and keeps ourselves relatively safe when we're getting close. And then when we get close to death, guys can send some EP to heal us, so yeah. Yeah, there you go. That's basically my strategy from here on out with most of these Divine Knight battles, so yeah. As of the main Vulcan, his Goliath unit was at big risk of self-destructing, but Vulcan has no desire to leave and continue living. And yeah, this was hinted back at the intermission, as it felt like he had already fulfilled his purpose at killing Osborne, so there isn't much else for him to do. So the Soldat explodes and Vulcan is no more, which left Reem with a deep scar of regret, and he blames himself for not saving Vulcan. 
It was kind of weird that Rain would feel that way for him, but he is a kind person at heart, and Vulcan probably wasn't um, going to cause any more trouble anyway, so yeah, it kind of felt like a waste of, like, you know, it kind of felt like a waste, you know, that he was just taking his own life like that, so yeah. Anyway, now things are all good in Rura, so the group has a break, and you can engage in more um, bonding events here too. This part was actually pretty good, because Angelica actually. Angelica, yeah, she's still kind of, you know, the girl liking woman that she is, but um, I feel like she shone much more bright on this part, because she acts more like a serious character. Which, yeah, she didn't really before in a similar situation in Call of 1. She definitely felt like kind of a joke of a character, to be honest, but yeah. Um, but here, though, I definitely like what they did with her more. She definitely seems like a more serious character. Um, of course, it does feel like, yeah, she's taking this war a lot more seriously, so that's also great to see. And of course, Elisa. They felt good to see her save her money as up there, yeah, mother as well. Um, of course, yeah, I always like seeing her too, because again, she has some amazing bonding events, which yeah, I'll go into later. And yeah, like I said, the part itself is also pretty good. And with this part as well, with Rura, like I said, the characters definitely shine quite brightly in this part too. Um, and yeah, the actual part is pretty good. Um, the stuff with Vulcan is a little weird, but I don't mind it too much to be honest, so yeah. Overall, I do like this second part of the act, so let's move on. So after the break, George here tells Rain that he's figured out a way to help make a powerful weapon for Valimar. So Professor Schmidt is also here, and he says he'll make it, but he needs Samurian ore for the process. And he figure out that the spirit shrines are where to find Samurian ore. So he may have encountered these spirit shrines before, since he can enter 3 out of 4 of them before, and complete a trial there for treasure and more AP. But yeah, now a new area of the shrine opens up with stronger enemies and more treasure at the end. As well as a magic knight guarding the area with the Zimmeran War, that also needs to be feared, so yeah, there you go, that's how these work. So, after clearing out the first shrine, they receive some disturbing news from the 4th arm of the vision. That Seldak has been attacked and set ablaze, and the one behind the attack was Duke Alberia. This is a really dark and emotional moment, especially since there was also some casualties too. Um, of course, this hits Eustace the hardest, and he, and he even attempts to leave the group to confront his father by himself. But the others um, state that yeah, they should work together instead. Then Rufus meshes them and tells him that the Noble Alliance took no part in the attack, and he doesn't condone his father's actions. So yeah, it does seem like Rufus wants his father at the picture, and Class 7 suspects that Rufus is using him to do that. They do eventually agree to go to Aurochs Fall and restrain Duke Alberia. So, using the 4th Armor Division, the RMP of distractions, Class 7 was able to make it to the fort with little issue, but waiting for them at the entrance is Scarlet. And like Vulcan, she's also using a new type of soldier, the Kestrel unit, which focuses more on agility and mobility. So, she also wants to fight Reem, but Reem will refuse to let her die just like with Vulcan. So, again, Reem wins the duel with my new strategy for these Divine Knight battles. Um, but Scott, Scott's soldier is also going to self destruct, but this time Reem was able to separate the culprit from the soldier, saving Scarlet from the explosion. So yeah, after that, Rain would stay behind to make sure that she is okay, while the rest stormed the fort. And yeah, Crow would even come along to check to see that Scarlet was safe too, and he offers some words of encouragement for leaving, so yeah. Interesting he would do that. There was something I forgot to mention too in the intermission actually. Um, I think it's revealed there that Crow was the one that actually tipped off Toval into Reed's location, so again, Kind of an interesting thing for him to do. But yeah. So after that, it's time to go inside the fort, and they encounter some northern Jaegers. But Sarah decides to fight them on her own. And as it turns out, Sarah used to be a member of the northern Jaegers, before she became a bracer and then instructor. And yeah, this hit me quite hard. 
Um, this made our conversation being at the bonfire and caused the one hit really different, as it does show why her early life was so rough to begin with, and I really felt for it now. And yeah, that was definitely one of my favorite character modes in the game. So yeah, Anakin, that's one reason why I really love Sarah too. Of course, she's pretty good in battle too. Her cross are pretty strong too, um, good damage, and had pretty decent utility as well. I also like this plot too because she also gets her new uh, Scarf Northern Lights as well, which yeah, again, I really love that. <laughs> um, yeah, Sarah definitely became one of my favorite characters after that moment as well, so yeah. So yeah, Sarah, yeah, she spent basically all of her energy on that battle, so yeah. So she's gonna rest while the rest of the group continues up the fortress. So they finally encounter Duke Alberia, who had um, Duvli as a bodyguard. So the group fights and does defeat her, forcing her to retreat. So yeah, now nothing can stop Duke Alberia being arrested by his own son, and now the Noble Alliance loses another powerful ally. So then the group then rests in Brayahar. And again, I also really like this part of the plot too, because yeah, it really raises the stakes of the um, plot as well, because of that horrific attack on Sildek. And yeah, you also have a cyclist too where you're trying to help out as well. And yeah, we got the great character moment with Sarah too, revealing what her past was. Oh well, what she did in her past, but like. We already had an idea of what it was like before, but yeah. Pretty sad stuff, and yeah, Eustace is also great here too. He really is growing into his own person as well, and he's not just some Alberera, I guess you could say. So yeah, again, great from him as well. So that's the end of that part of Act 2, let's continue. So yeah, with that business out of the way, it's time to clear the remaining shrines to get the Zemurin ore from. So yeah, the second and first shrines are pretty simple, but the, third, the fourth and final one would be a little bit different, as Vita is back again and decides to meet the group, and she reveals some pretty shocking truths. So basically, Rena's been seeing some memories when he's been in these shrines, and um, Vita confirms that these memories are from Tricol's The Lionheart. As well as also, yeah, the events of this hall also resembles the War of the Lions too, the one that Tricol's obviously fought. And yeah, she also reveals the duty of the witches too, something Emma didn't even know about. Marine encourages her to not lose her result. So Emma accepts the truth and realizes she wants to live her own life. And yeah, again, it was great to see Emma develop a lot in this game too. Um, it's also a great character moment for her too because she also learns her next S craft as well. In this situation as well. Um, <clears throat> we didn't get to move much about in Calls to One yet. Like I said, it is great to see that, yeah, Calls to Two really did a good job of, you know, growing a character as well. Um, yeah, I really like Emma in this game too. I really like what she does, but yeah. So, you know, Vita then challenges the pie with her familiar Grianus, but it wasn't enough. So she leaves after that, allowing the pie to cut the last piece of Samurai or they need. So, yeah. So yeah, with that out of the way, let's go on to the final bit of this act. So, George and Schmidt can now start working on the weapon for Valimor. I believe at this point too, I think with the first piece they make like a prototype sword and it's been doing quite well actually, so yeah. I think that's how, um, I think that's how you get heavenly slash, actually no, I don't think it is, but yeah. Like I said, they've been using like a prototype sword, but now with all the pieces though, they can make the perfect weapon. And yeah, another important thing about this upper too, it's supposed to match the wielder. And yeah, that means that yeah, Valmar's gonna be getting a touch sheet to match um Green's weapon. But anyway. So with that now, Captain Claire then contacts the Krajus and tells them that the Noble Alliance is gathering mature the forces around Heimdall at the cost of loaning their grip across the country. So the big takeaway here, of course, is that Trista is now less defended. So Class 7 knows that this is the opportunity they've been waiting for, so they plan out how they're going to retake both Trista and the Academy. So yeah, now it's time for the operation and the first thing to do was take back Trista. So it's being guarded by some Panzer Soldats, which yeah, Valma made very quick work of. Um, 
So yeah, now that Trista has been freed, peace has been restored, and the residents gave the Liberators a very warm welcome. A very feel-good moment for both Class 7 and the player, to be honest, because yeah, I have kind of missed this place a little bit, so yeah, it's great to be back, I guess. Now it's time to take back the Akami, and to do this, Class 7 splits into two groups to take on their opponents. And yeah, during this part too, you get a new guest character, Toa. Um, she seems to be kind of a support base caster, and also has a craft that makes the enemy more vulnerable to arts by decreasing their resistance to the arts elements. Yeah, again, pretty cool to see her also become playable for the first time too. So yeah, there's kind of hinted at too, that about her weapon too, it's a gun actually, a special orbital gun. And yeah, there was a bomb conversation at Rain where yeah, it kind of shows that off as well, so that's really cool. So, so the ones charge at guarding the academy were the upper class students who are calling themselves the Order of the Lion. This group was led by Patrick Hyars, a noble and rival sorts in Cause the One. Yeah, this guy gets up to large shenanigans in that game. Um, these students consider Class 7 as their rivals, so they wanted to stake their pride and honor in a battle against Class 7. And yeah, Class 7 would be the ones to win out in the end, but the other did put up a good fight with the ability to use combat links too. So now Patrick sees Arena as an equal, and he disbands the Order of the Lion, so they can now support the Courageous and Class 7 has achieved one of the main objectives in this conflict, which again, ends Act 2. So yeah, retaking the Akami did feel very satisfying too, as it really felt that we have come a long way now that Class 7 has managed to achieve one of the big goals. So yeah, as for Act 2 as a whole, it really shook up the form in a good way thanks to Courageous, allowing for an open, more open experience compared to Act 1, and the stakes of the plot have also grown accordingly too, and it keeps making you feel intrigued on what's going to to happen next. So yeah, I really love what Act 2 was able to accomplish of course, and yeah, really can't wait to see how things are going to play out now. It's now time to start the final act. Before the action can start, the students took some time to celebrate. Meanwhile, Rain has something a little bit different in mind, where he wants to visit the dorms again. I can do this at a personal choice, so this is the final bonding event, and basically the romantic event for this game too. And the person that comes along must have had certain bonding events viewed, which the game does highlight, as the states will have an effect later. So, thanks to saving and reloading, I was able to view the event with Alfin, Toa, Fee, Sarah, Elisa, and Laura. The Laura would be the kind choice of this playthrough. So yeah. Oh boy, these scenes. They are amazing, as they really warmed my heart and made me feel emotional too. And we also had some great moments too, like Toa, she was hugging Reen, and Elisa embracing Reen, and uh, yeah, like I said, they really tucked on the heartstrings too. Elisa also kisses Reen too, so yeah. Yeah, that was some weird moments. Sarah gave Reen a surprise kiss, but yeah. But to be honest though, the rest of the conversation is actually pretty good, so I don't mind. And yeah. To be honest though, yeah, Sarah and Rian's relationship is one I actually quite like, so yeah. Now about Elisa as well, I feel like, yeah, Lisa got the best, um, because of her bond conversations beforehand, because, yeah, they really revealed that, yeah, um, these two actually knew each other before, um, the events of the game, actually, because I believe Elisa was, like, lost or something, and then, yeah, Reen helped her back to Yamir and stuff, and they looked out there too, so that's really nice. There's also a bomb conversation where, um, um, Elisa wants to go check, um, the inside of Valma too, that was also a great moment too, and then, yeah, like I said, this, um, moment, yeah, this definitely f showed that, yeah, these two are great together. I like Laura, of course, Laura also has a really good moment too. Again, yeah, I really like the chemistry, that pretty much, yeah, I like all these conversations to be honest, they were great. Um, of course, like I said, Elisa definitely has the most payoff, I feel like, because of how well it's built up, but the others do do a good job too. Like, yeah, I was pretty happy with Laura, the one I picked to be canned for this playthrough, so yeah. So yeah, I do love these summer romantic modes, and this final bonding event might be one of my favorites in recent memory as well. So yeah, like I said, I really love this. Um, well, so while doing research for this video too, I looked up and I actually found out that yeah, this final bonding effect can also be done with any of the dudes as well. But I doubt they are romantic, but that's also nice to get the 
that they also get some love too. Of course, Rain also really cares about them as well, so yeah. It makes a lot of sense. And yeah, <laughs> now let's move on to the actual action of the final act now. So, after making some final preparations, including finalizing Valamar's part of the Itachi, it's time for Class 7 to do their next mission, which is to recruit to rescue the Imperial family and the Leafs, are being kept at the Karel Imperial Villa in Heimdall. So they're able to reach the villa thanks to the help of the Imperial Army, as well as the fellow students they were able to rescue as well. Um, inside the villa, yeah, this place is really heavily guarded by some powerful enemies, but the group managed to make it to the room with the hostages. But one last obstacle remains in the form of Altina, who also confirms that she might be related to Millium here too. So yeah, they managed to beat her in battle and are able to rescue the Imperial family and reunite Marcus with his father and Rina's sister too. And yeah, I haven't really talked about Marcus that much, but I did like what he was able to do in this plot, so yeah. Um, again, being the first person that Rin met, um, Back in Celtic, yeah, I think that's why I have kind of a soft spot for him in this game, so yeah, I quite like Marcus here. But anyway, though, things will make a very bad turn for the worst, though. Um, as yeah, the group learned that Duke Kyan has taken Prince Cedric for his own plans. And then, just like that, something dark and twisted rose in place of the Valfling Palace, the Infernal Castle. So, according to Emma, it must have been summed by the Hex and Clan's most forbidden incantation. And yeah, it should be pretty obvious who did that, but anyway. Not only that, but Reen could also feel Crow's presence in the castle, so it must be waiting there for their fateful battle. So, Reen and the rest of Class 7 makes their way to the castle, and with Valamar's the weapon, they are able to cut through the front door to get in. So here we go, this is the final dungeon of the game, the Infernal Castle. And yeah, this is a pretty long one. Um, with like three main sections basically. Um, lots of powerful enemies too, some pretty dangerous random cars, and of course some powerful bosses waiting at the end of each of those areas, so yeah. The first boss is a battle against um, Duvely and Blue Block. So yeah, they put up a good fight, but then Duvely unleashes her hidden powers, but just when things are dire, Oliver and Toval come in to intervene and hold those two off so Class 7 can carry on. Then we have the second battle. This one is against Zio, Zeno and Leo, and it is pretty obvious that those two would be um, the opponents because the door before that fight had a Zephyr logo on them. And yeah, it's pretty obvious that yeah, you should probably bring feel on this one, so yeah. And yeah, Sigur Fi, yeah, this will prove a very shiny moment for her. And she gets to interact with them and show how much she has grown, which again, that's great to see. Those two also tell Fee that they will tell her what is going on with her, but only if they can beat them, so yeah. So Class 7 does manage to overcome them, but they can still keep going. But then, um... But those two can still keep going, but then more help comes in. This time it's Sharon and Claire's turn to build them out. So yeah. Now Class 7 is able to go past them, but those two leave a kind of massive bombshell where the leader of Zephyr, Rutger um, Klossel, is still alive. And yeah, that's a big shot for V, and probably something important to remember for the sequels too, so yeah. Now it's quite big stuff, so yeah. Again, I really like V in this game too, easily one of my favorite characters as well. Um, she hasn't grown as much as in Costa 2, but she still has grown quite a bit, and yeah, she's really becoming her own woman now. Um, she can definitely um, fend for herself now, despite um, losing her family in here. Class 7 is kind of like her own new family as well. That was kind of something I got from her bonding event with Reen as well, so yeah, I really like Fee in this game. Very good character. Now it's time for the third boss, McBurn. Oh boy. And yeah, he really loves it. It's his name of one of the strongest Ouroboros in forces, as his boss fight is a rough one, especially since he also has instant death attacks too. And yeah, that can really mess you up. It does the up quite a bit too. But he somehow best him, but as it turns out, he was really holding back. And then it reveals his true power, where he gets white hair similar to Reen and his eyes become black and red. 
he gets markings of his body and can materialize a demonic, a demonic sword called Angler. He also gets a new title, he's known as McBurn, the Blazing Demon. So we really need someone special to bail us out here. Luckily that person is the Radiant Blade Master himself, my camp RC. And yeah, watching those two fight, it does really feel like we are two leagues below them, so yeah. So while that's happening, we make our way to our final destination. And yeah, while on the topic, yeah, let's talk about McBurn a little bit because um, he's interesting. Um, he does this role of an overpowered villain really well, considering that lazy attitude, showing he doesn't care about anyone else um, unless they are on his level, and his demonic transformation really helps live up to his child, the Blazing Demon, and enforce the number one. I also learned something pretty cool about him too, during my playthrough as well. Um, apparently, um, a lot of people really wanted to voice this dude, and yeah, I can definitely see why, considering what he does in the plot, so yeah. Again, very interesting for them, and yeah, I can't wait to see what he does in future games too, so yeah. At the top of the Inferno Castle awaits Class 7's final destination, the Vermilion Throne. And here, Crow and Vito are waiting for them. So, Ron, Irene also tells Crow the promise he made to Toa, Angelica, and George. They'll bring back Crow and force him to graduate with him. And yeah, Irene had tons of determination to do this. Then, Duke Kayan decides he's going to make his presence known. And we also learn about his motivation for starting this war in the first place. So, his ancestor is Emperor Orphros known as the False Emperor during the War of the Lions, and Kaya wanted to realize his ancestors' dream and make the country ruled by the nobility. And yeah, Kaza was pretty appalled by his selfishness, especially considering he was going to use Prince Cedric as a tool for those goals too. So to stop him and rescue Cedric, though, they need to get past Crow and Vito, who are going to fight together as well. There's another tricky battle that did get out of hand quite quickly, but I managed to re Gain my composure and managed to overcome them both. So, yeah. With those two done, now it's time for the battle being built up ever since the end of Call Still 1. A duel between Rhi and Crow in the Divine Knights. And yeah, using everything I learned about battling with Valmar, I helped Rhi to finally overcome his rival. So, yeah, now Crow and Vita accept the defeat, signaling, to, signaling the, the Noble Alliance's defeat and marking the end of the war. Unfortunately though, out of desperation, Kyan decides to make use of Cedric by using to revive the entity responsible for the calamity 250 years ago, the Vermilion Apocalypse. It draws its power from Cedric as he has on a royal family blood. It immediately showcases its monstrous power by draining the mana of the people across the Empire. Vito put up a barrier to protect Class 7, but yeah, the Apocalypse will eventually break through it but it lasted long enough for Crow to get his weapon enchanted by Vita, so he can deal a significant blow to the Apocalypse. So now it's time to fight it. So this fight is unique as it has three distinct phases. For the first to use Class 7 and the party members you get also switch in the second phase. Yeah, the familiar Apocalypse here yeah, hits like a truck and is pretty resilient, so this wasn't an easy fight either, but I eventually overcome the first two phases. The third and final phase involves Valma and Ordeen working together as the powers have been restored. And this was a lot more straightforward to the first two phases due to how strong both of them are. And yeah, they even have a combat link going on too, and yeah of course they can perform follow up attacks too. So yeah, in order to save Cedric from the Apocalypse Core, Crow would draw its attention to give Reen an opening, but the cost of the Apocalypse inflicting a heavy blow on Ordeen's chest. Despite that, Crow's words from Crouchick kept Reem focused on the target, and he managed to free Cedric from the core, causing the monster to fade away for good. So yeah, Heimdall has not been saved, and Cedric seems safe and sound, but the same can't be said for Crow, unfortunately, as he also bore the brunt of that heavy blow, and it would prove a fatal wound, as Emma and Celine's healing could only delay the inevitable. He would give each member of Class 7 supplying words and told them all to live their lives with hope for the future. And yeah, Class 7 really didn't take Crow's death well, and things would only get worse as Kyan was still desperate to win, so he had Cedric at knife point. So Vita attempted to deal with 
him herself, but before she could, she was attacked by Rufus all people, who in turn to rest both Cayenne and Vita for their actions. This is strange though, since Rufus would be on the side of those two being a member of the Noble Alliance. Though things would become crystal clear when Claire and Lecter arrived on the scene, revealing the shock and revealed that Rufus is a primary member of the Iron Bloods. Though that reveal would pale in comparison to the next big reveal, as another person would come in, Chancer Goliath Osborne who was somehow alive after being shot through the heart by Crow during Colston 1. And yet, Osborne here would reveal that Rufus is acting basically as a double agent to weaken the Noble Alliance from within, and also reveals his plans moving forward, that he's going to take over Ouroboros' Phantasmal Blaze plan, as well as move forward with the Occupation of Crossbell. And yeah, uh, Reed doesn't take that well. He was pretty livid with this outcome, considering that all of Crow's life would prove meaningless, considering Osborne is still alive, so he lets out all of his emotions. But then, um, even more big reveals, Rufus would then inform Reed that Osborne's actions were tied to him as well, which caused a memory from 12 years ago to resurface, showing that Reed's blood father was Osborne himself. It also seems that Osborne is suffering a mind for Reed, as he is a national hero reclaimed the capital. And that ends the final act. So yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. So, let's start with Crow first, who is kind of weird to talk about to be honest. So yeah, despite being one of the main catalysts of the war in Cold Steel 1, he's actually kind of supportive of Freem for the most of the story. You'd think that he wouldn't want to take part, he wouldn't be want, he wouldn't want to take be a part of the Noble Alliance in that case, and instead strike out on his own, but I assume Vita and Kai might be the reason he's forced to stay. It's also kind of weird that Rin is pretty supportive of Crow 2, since he was the one of the main catalysts of the war, but Rin kind of treats what he did as not a big deal, since he still sees some good in Crow, which does make the fact that all the party tears up of his death a bit weird too. So maybe I'm missing something, but Crow does seem like kind of a confusing character in Constant 2. It does feel like, yeah, I don't know if, um... Again, it's kind of weird, because yeah, he did something really bad, and none of the characters seem to, like, care that much. They did something quite bad. Oh no, though. <laughs> Again, maybe I'm missing something, but yeah. Um... But again, yeah, like I said, Crow's kind of a weird character to talk about. But hey, everything else though is pretty positive though about that ending. Let's talk about Rufus a little bit. Yeah, he did play his role of double agent really well, and it was kind of hard to tell that he was an Iron Blood throughout the plot too. So yeah, I'm pretty interested to see what he's going to get up to in the sequel as well. Oh boy, but Osborne though. Yeah, my mind blew up when I saw him come back from the dead, and then it blew up again after it was revealed that he was the father of the main protagonist too. And yeah, uh, him coming back also highlights just how important Stardor 8 and Stardor 14 are in Skyler 3rd, since the former sets up Osborne as rivalry with Oliver. And yeah, now it's time to pay off, but there is still probably more to come in Cold Steel 3 and 4. That introduces the Phantasmal Blaze plan, which Osborne's going to take over for who knows what in Cold Steel Frame 4. So yeah. Yeah, like I said, uh, this guy, man. It's going to be very interesting to see what he gets up to um, in the sequels, obviously. And yeah, he might be, he's probably going to be like one of the most important antagonists in my mind. That's what I predict. And yeah. Considering how this game ends and how some of the characters view him too, and yeah, I could see this like being like a battle between like Oliver and um, because remember that remember that Oliver was the one who made Class Seven in the first place. So yeah, I can definitely see this being like a war between Oliver and Osborne. Kind of like what the kind of like what Star Dot Eight is kind of hinting towards too, I guess. So yeah. So yeah, like I said, oh boy, that. <laughs> That guy, alright. Yeah, my blight. Yeah, like I said, my blight blew up. Yeah, my reaction must have been gold dust to whoever knew that was gonna happen. So, yeah. Um, yeah, these guys, man. They definitely do have some insane plot to us. And yeah, this one, yeah, comes to mind. You might also be wondering how I think he survived. I was. 
initially think it was a body double, I feel like that's too easy. It has to be something I wouldn't get normally, like probably some kind of like Ouroboros thing or something like that. Or maybe he's getting help from someone that we don't even know of yet, I have no idea. Like I said, him coming back, yeah, that really caught me off guard, so yeah. Yep, I'm not so sure how he came back to be honest, but yeah. <laughs> Again, those who know how he came back are probably, um, yeah, enjoying this a lot, but anyway. So that done though, we're far from over though. There's still quite a bit of game left, actually. Now it's time for something known as the, the Divertism. <laughs> kind of hard to let to say, but anyway. So, now Erebon is firmly in Osborne's grasp, with Rufus Alperea by his side. Together, they presented Reen as the hero who had put an end to the war that had ravished Erebonia. Two months later, Crossfell would be invaded by Erebonia, leaving the city-state entirely under its control. Calvard would launch a counter-offense against Erebonia, but they stood little chance against the Panzer Soldats as well as Reen, now known as the Ashen Chevalier, who was sent to Crossbell to help fend them off. During this time, Osborn also performed a speech at Orcus Tower, where he names Rufus as Crossbell's first Governor General, and yet Rufus' first act was to announce that the formerly independent state would be annexed into Erebonia, stripping Crossbell of its freedom. So yeah, pretty big stuff, obviously. But now we change perspective and meet a member of the Crossbell Police Department, Lloyd Vannings, and one of their allies, Rix Rishia Mal. Their mission is to navigate Crossbell's underground network, specifically the Geofront's E sector, to keep Crossbell's top secret info out of Erebonia's hands. They plan to do this by copying the information from the core terminal and then reformat the terminal itself. And yeah, we also got to play as Lloyd and Risha, and they're both quite fun. They both seem to focus on physical damage, and I have some pretty fun crafts to use, alongside some pretty nice quartz and master quartz at this disposal too. I also quite like the design, especially Risha's, and the voice acting is really nice too. Lloyd was kind of funny in that regard, considering that his voice is clearly Robbie Damon, who, which is fine considering I catch you with a fight, but anyway. So the Geofront is kind of a complex dungeon with a couple of switching platform puzzles and some potentially dangerous enemies, but it isn't too long, so the two of them make it to their destination. So all they have to do now is wait for the data to finish copying. Unfortunately, they get interrupted when a mysterious boy and girl arrive on the scene, and it should be pretty obvious to play out that those two are Reen and Altina. So first off, of course, Reen actually fighting against us, basically, and also he's working together with Altina as well. So it's time for a battle to help store enough time for the for the data wipe to finish. It was a tough battle since th those two can use S cross against you, but Lloyd and Risha do manage to overcome them. Rain decides to stop holding back, it seems like he's gonna use his ogre powers um, against Lloyd and Risha, but the data finished copying just in Reen then decides to switch objectives and summon Malabar to destroy the terminal. It seems Rain had them cornered, but he states that arrest warrants haven't been issued for either of them. <clears throat> so Rain allows them past, while Lloyd takes the initiation um, unit and escapes with it. Lloyd then asks for the name of the person he faced off against, which is of course Rain. So yeah, now we switch perspectives back to Rain, and he calls Lecter to report his failure. But let them accept it without reprimanding it. And it also sounded like he was familiar with Lloyd and Risha too, which is probably important, but anyway. Now Reen was going to return to Trista, so he bids farewell to Altina. Before he leaves, he took one final glance in the direction of Lloyd and Risha had fled, and seemed somewhat jealous of their ability to push forward through impossible odds and believe in the future. Reen then begins his trip back to Trista, which ends the divert. Divertissement. <laughs> so yeah, it's a pretty interesting thing because yeah, it shows what's going on in Crossbell, due to of course Oddspawn's evasion and how Lloyd is adapting to as well. Then we also get to see what Reen is getting up to now that yeah, he has been made a hero thanks to Oddspawn as well. And yeah, the main reason to show all this is most likely because Crossbell is going to be important for Cold Steel 3 and 4 as well. Again, I'm not entirely sure how yet, but yeah. 
that's what it seems like. And yeah, this is actually a pretty interesting experience too, because I actually want to play the crossbow piece next, Trails of Zero and Trails of Mature. And yeah, these games actually take place before the Cold Stock games, so it's pretty cool to get a taste of what those games might be like, thanks to using Void a little bit too. Overall, a pretty cool extra thing to show that probably has an important purpose for your Charles as well. I did like what I got to see with Void and Reaches too, since the two did get along quite well. So yeah, again, it makes me pretty excited to see what um, Lloyd will get up to in um, Trails of Zero when I start playing that one day. So yeah, I really like this spot too, this is really cool. Let's move on to the end of the game now, the epilogue. Now it's time for the epilogue. So when Reen returns to Trista, he comes across Claire who have been waiting for him. But yeah, Reen did feel like he was in kind of a bad mood, so he gave Claire the cold shoulder due to her relation to Rupus and Osborne. Leaving the station though, things do get a lot more positive, as a wave of nostalgia washed over them as he looked out at Trista once more. And it's reminded of the time he and Class 7 were finally able to set it free from the Noble Lions. After that, he would be greeted by Class 7, and they make their way to the Academy together. Things were peaceful in Erebonia thanks to the Noble Alliance being no more, as well as the situation in Crossbelt 2, so Class 7 could return to being normal students. The days flew by with the class, with class 7 enjoying the time they still had together. With the final free day around the corner, Reen was able to spend some quality time with the person he spent some time with before the day of the finale, or the special someone if you want to show on it. In my case that would be Laura, and once again I do love how these two interact in intimate scenes like this. After that, Reen would go visit the engineering building and meet George and Angelica, who got to share their plans of travelling around the continent. It's clear to them that Reen was still feeling a bit troubled about the business of Crossbelt, but they reassured Reen that he that what he is doing is helping to save lives in Crossbelt too. After that, he paid the student council room a visit and find Toa sleeping. Kinda like in Costa 1 in the computer room. But anyway, she mumbled Crow's name in her sleep which caused Reen to gasp and then caused her to wake up. She could also see that something was up with Reen so he tells him to sit down and have a chat. She tells Reen that there was no need to do everything life through him and it's okay to sit and rest if things get too hard. And yeah, this causes Reen to let it all out and confess his regret of losing Crow and break his promise to her and to to her, and Toa reassured him that he did everything he could. And yeah, despite the feelings about Crow, this is a powerful scene, it really does show how kind-hearted Toa really is, and why she fit the role of student council president so well. Also being the captain of the courageous, Toa has really done a lot of good things in this game, which is great to see. I can definitely see her being good with Reen too, she doesn't have the best, like, endgame scene with Reen, because it's basically in the Stuart Castle room, and the only real change is that Reen basically talks about having a plushie of her or something like that. But yeah, still though, I really like these two together, they're great. The scene before the finale, that was a really good one, and yeah, like I said, I really like Toa a lot. Definitely a very, very nice person. But anyway. So... Now it's time to walk back to the dorm, and the rest of the class several is there to walk with Reen too. Before the final day, Reen can go check around the dorms and talk to his fellow classmates about their future plans. The things getting more special, Reen's special someone. And yeah, these conversations do feel a bit bittersweet, especially for the special someone, since they do want to spend more time with Reen, but they do know they have to go their separate ways for now. But Reen reassures the other person that he'll always be thinking about them and that they'll be able to eventually meet one day. That might be a good time to think about Laura too, who I did remember more for a combat prowess, but her character was pretty great, and it's great to see some of her cool moments in the plot, like her rivalry of sorts with Doofily, and of course the bonding events and special events with Doreen, but really great too. I do show that these two are great together, and yeah, I can't wait to see what how strong she gets after advanced training with Father 2. Yeah, like I said, I do like all these conversations too. I did get to see some of the other Events the special summon here, like Elisa's, I got to see Sarah's I think too. Um, I looked those ones up because it was interested, and yeah, I like them too. Um, yeah, again, this one's a lot more bittersweet 
Tetsu Alpha 1 because you, uh, again, they have to go to separate ways. But again, it's really powerful stuff, and again, it really shows that, yeah, they really knew what they were doing with writing the romances in this game, I feel like. So, yeah, again, that was great to see. Let's move on now. So, now it's time for the free day, which actually works like the free days in Cold Steel 1, where Rain gets some quests and needs to do some of them to advance the plot. And yeah, these last couple of quests do have some pretty fun moments to see as well. Like, you have some big battles, you have the swimming coming back for a little bit too. Pretty fun stuff. But anyway, after completing the quest, Rain then feels an odd presence at the old schoolhouse. So he goes over to take a look. And when he arrives, the presence vanished, but Tovel, Elise, Alphen, and Claire showed up. And Reen took this opportunity to clear the air between himself and Claire so they can get back on good terms. So yeah, they all have a chat together, talk about, you know, I think the plans are reformed and stuff. But then the bells of the old schoolhouse rang out, and it also started to glow again, similar to what happened at the school festival. And yeah, the rest of Class 7 also come over to see what was going on, and they all decided to check to see what was inside. The inside had been transformed into the true final dungeon of the game, the Reverie Corridor. Valma claims a separate trial has been activated, but the particulars of this trial remain unclear. So, let's talk about the Reverie Corridor a little bit. So, it has a lot of interesting things going along with it. This dungeon is kind of randomly generated, as the chests contain random treasure, and the areas can change layout every time the player enters the dungeon from the outside. This also revives the monsters and resets the chests, allowing the player to conquer it as many times as desired. So yeah, this is basically like a late game grindy area I guess as well, because yeah, you do have access to everyone. Every playable character, including the guests, can be used in this place, and everyone else, and everyone is able to overdrive with each other too. Plus, the amount of Link EXP gained in battles has increased to three times its usual amount. So yeah, again, this does show that this place is kind of more of a... You can also grind this place too, basically. You can get a lot of cool quartz, you can... because yeah, that's many of the treasure contains. Yeah, there's a lot of cool things about this place. Gameplay-wise, but anyway. Keep in mind that the enemies are stronger than they were before, and I think you need at least four members of Class 7 to fight the bosses. Those turn out to be the cryptids that we fought earlier. Um, the optional ones, but anyway. The only true new playable character here is Alpha, because she now has a weapon of her own. A staff, actually. And that means she can now use Cross, and she has some pretty great support Cross, like a strong buffing one, and her s craft is similar to Kevin's Grail Sphere, which again, that's really nice. Um, speaking of playable characters, the Reverie Corridor is the only place in the game where you can buy and use the Phantasmal Mirrors, which are accessories that transform the character into a normally unplayable character, with those five characters being Altina, Crow, Vita, Lloyd, and Risha. And they seem pretty powerful too, as they receive new quartz sets when they transform. One big catch other than these mirrors only working in the Reverie Corridor is that they cost 200,000 each, so yeah, they're very expensive. At the end of the Reverie Corridor is the true final boss, Lower Luciferia. Its deal is to govern the Shadow Trial, and it came back due to the Infernal Castle's destruction. Since Class 7 has already passed the trial for Valma, there was nothing more to gain by passing the Shadow Trial, but Class 7 decided to take it as one final act to mark the end of their time together as Class 7. So yeah, Lower Luciferia also has this fair shot of dangerous attacks, like Lower Erebonios. Like, I think he has like one attack which like reduces everyone to very low health or something like that. That was a pretty dangerous one, but yeah, Class 7 gave it that all and managed to overcome yet another trial. It then hit them that this is it with Million being the first one to get emotional and start crying, with everyone else falling suit. This is the first time the group had let out the emotions that they're building up, the sadness of having to split up. Yeah, it was a pretty powerful scene here. Yeah. It just felt like, yeah, this is it. You've done it. <laughs> this is basically the end of the game, and yeah, Class 7 has to go to a separate lease now, and yeah. I definitely felt a little bit sad too, because we've been through so much. Not only Call Still 1, of course, but also most of Call Still 2 as well. On the on the day where they all depart, they have all they have all gone over their grief and all faced each other with brilliant smiles. 
While they would be going their separate ways, they all believed I'd be able to be a gun. And they also thanked Sarah for being the wonderful instructor that she was. Everyone but Reen would be moving uh, on working toward their future, while Reen decided to complete his second year to try and graduate from the academy. It wouldn't be easy for him, since he is still forced to accept the government's orders for him and Valimar, but he did promise his friends something very important. Filled with determination, he strode forward towards his future, ending Cole's still to his story. So yeah, let's conclude things now. So this epilogue and finale for the whole game is great, as it wraps up this game's story nicely. has a ton of emotional moments that really did add to the, fin the finality of this arc, and does make me quite excited for the future of the series too. So it's a great way to wrap up an already great game that really does improve on its already good people, both in terms of gameplay and even story, since there were many new additions and improvements that made the gameplay more fun, and I felt like there were more, there were even more meaningful and powerful moments here too. I think one of the big things about that was Reen himself. Reen goes through such an emotional roller coaster for this game, and yeah, I think he just does his job so well as the main protagonist. Like yeah, I did feel for him a lot of those powerful moments too. Like yeah, the stuff with Crow is not like perfect, but again, I feel like I might be missing stuff, it might be kind of a nitpick too, but yeah. Still, the Rain's such a great protagonist. And yeah, a lot of the emotional scenes I feel like wouldn't have as much weight if he wasn't the main character, so yeah. Um, I like Rain a lot <laughs> in this game. But yeah. And yeah, the rest of the class too is great too. Sure, some of them are more re relevant than others, but yeah, a lot of them do develop across this game too, and yeah, it does show that your class still too is willing to, you know, help develop the class as well, which again, that's also great to see too. Um, again, yeah, there's a lot to love with this class, I feel like, so yeah. Um, so again, <laughs> I really like this class, and yeah, once again, Cold Steel 2, yeah, it really did exceed my expectations. So like I said, I'm very excited to see what the crossover games are like, since those are the next trail games I want to play. But I'm also excited to see how things play out in Cold Steel 3, of course. That's of course, well, the game that takes place after this game, so yeah. And yeah, just like with Cold Steel 1, Cold Steel 2 is again an RPG I highly recommend giving a go, so yeah. That is that. So yeah, this video of course took a long time for me to make because yeah, the scripting process took me a long time to make because I wanted to make sure that yeah, I was doing everything properly with it and yeah, things turned out quite good in the end. Um, so yeah, of course, I'm going to be going back to, you know, going back to my playthroughs now of this episode is up and yeah. And all that, and yeah, like I said, <laughs> I really love Trails now. Cold Steel 2 is definitely one of my favorite games I've played this year, up there with Farm and Gage and Took Extreme Racer Drift 2. So yeah, I love this game so much. It was definitely a lot of fun to play. And yeah, it was also fun, you know. I mean, I did already have an idea that this game would be great, but again, it really blew my expectations. So yeah, I can't wait to see what's going to happen in future games as well. Um, not only like, you know, um, the next game's gonna play, but also, yeah, of course, close to frame 4. Can't wait to see what's up with those games as well, because, yeah, I'm very curious, so, yeah. So, I think that's that. This is me signing off, and, yeah, I hope you look forward to seeing what I have next in store.